the order of service for Sunday, October 25th, 2020. Reformation Sunday and Peak Sunday. Quote of the week. I cannot choose but to adhere to the word of God, which has possession of my conscience, nor can I possibly, nor will I even make any recantation, since it is neither safe nor honest to act contrary to conscience. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. So help me God. Amen. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther, Church Reformer. Before we worship, we reflect. Rooted in the past and growing in the, into the future, the church must always be reformed in order to live up the love of Christ in an ever-changing world. We celebrate the news of God's grace, that Jesus Christ sets us free every day to do this life-transforming work. Trusting in the freedom given to us in baptism, we pray for the church, that Christians will unite more fully in worship and mission. Luther spent a great deal of time trying to know who God was and to find ways of expressing what he came to know and believe so that others would know God too. He used fourth language, drank beer, and wrote hymns using liturgical tunes that people knew and recognized. When he wrote his catechism, he used language his small son could understand. He even translated the Bible into the German language people spoke. Truth about God and our faith, as complex as it is, should be something we can grasp and wrestle with. The message of Reformation Sunday is God's love for us. It is a love that frees us and redefines us as people of God and as members of the whole body of Christ. In God's eyes, we are beautiful. Call to worship. God is our dwelling place year after year, age to age, and yet we become complacent, forgetting who we are. God reforms us and makes prosper the work of our hands. God's life surges forth through creation, like grass that renews every morning. And yet we prefer to be dust, swept, in the way, swept away in the wind of every new idea and new fad. God reforms us and makes prosper the work of our hands. God turns to us and has compassion on us. So the great work of our lives manifests Christ's glorious love to the world. God reforms us and makes us prosper the work of our hands. The children's song is in Voices United, number 412. This is today. Centering Prayer. Gracious God, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Fill it with all truth and peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is in error, direct it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, strengthen it. Where it is in need, provide for it. Where it is divided, Reunite it. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A new creed. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is created who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, 
to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. And now, if I may have the attention of the children and the children at home. Communication. How we speak and interact with each other. In any relationship, communication is the means to health and wholeness. When we communicate well, our relationships thrive. Think about how many times your parents have said to you when you're upset. Use your words. That way, there's no guessing. Your mom and dad know exactly how you feel because you used your words. Well, Martin Luther tried to use his words, and he thought it would go better than he did, than it did. Martin Luther was a Roman Catholic monk, a priest, a pastor, who was devoted to God and to God's people. He was also loud, stubborn, and he was looking forward to debating, to talking excitedly and loudly about problems in the church that he believed needed to be fixed. Martin Luther wanted communication and a healthy church. So he nailed a large piece of paper to the Catholic Church door listing 95 problems or theses or points for debate or discussion that he wanted to discuss and fix. 95 is a large number. Five less than a hundred. That is a lot of problems. The church was in a mess. As you can see, as I unroll this paper, that they would have been talking for a very long time. So here I go. Stay with me. Here's the piece of paper. And it keeps going and going and going and going that's a lot of problems almost six feet of problems well things didn't work out quite the way luther wanted them to still God took the situation that had gone bad and made something positive come out of it. Oh, we still have our struggles, even 500 years later. And God still works with us, the church, helping us communicate with each other, helping us to understand each other, helping us to forgive each other. What I find beautiful in all the communication that goes on in the church is not whether we are right or wrong. Rather, it is that we keep trying to communicate, understand, and forgive. That is what Jesus and the church is all about. mission and service. We love our ministers. The Reverend Bronwyn Corliss shares this reflection. When my father was sick, my minister visited. The minister didn't stay long, just long enough to let us know we were cared for 
sought out and prayed for. We were not alone. After I was in a car crash, I visited my minister to share my fear, anxiety, and confusion. My minister listened and asked questions. Not too many, just enough to let me know I was hurt. I was okay, and I was prayed for. I was not alone. Our ministers are present in the big moments. Baptisms and funerals, weddings and divorces, celebrations and crises. They are there in the everyday moment, visiting, witnessing, and walking with us. They remind us of God's presence while we wrestle with life, faith, and love. Ministers are not perfect or infallible. They each have different gifts from God and are called to unique service. Thank you to our ministers. Thank you for the sermon, the prayers, and the visit. Thank you for the time you leave your own family to sit with someone else. Thank you for your leadership and your late nights. Thank you for answering God's call and living out, living it out in the United Church of Canada. Thanks to our gift to mission and service, ministers are supported through training at theological schools and education centers and through continuing education. If mission and service giving is already a regular part of your life, thank you so much. If you have not given, Please join me in making mission and service giving a regular part of your life of faith. Loving our neighbor is at the heart of mission and service. Prayer for Illumination Holy One, we prefer you as an architect whose desire is to construct for us perfect lives. And yet the witness of the scriptures says otherwise. No, your word is explosive. It is a live wire, one that electrifies all who are in reach. By the power of your Holy Spirit, shine yet more light forth from your holy word, shocking our hardened hearts back to life with your free given grace. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Reading and Song. The first reading is from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. The renewed covenant will not be breakable, but like the old covenant, it will expect the people to live upright lives. To know the Lord means that one will defend the cause of the poor and the needy. The renewed covenant is possible only because the Lord will forgive iniquity and not remember sin. Our hope lies in a God to forget. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors, when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer will they teach each other or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Psalm 46 
The response is, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. The God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be moved, and though the mountains shake in the depths of the sea, though its waters rage and foam, and though the mountains tremble with its tumult, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city, it shall not be shaken. God shall help it at the break of day. The nations rage and the kingdom shake. God speaks and the earth melts away. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come now, regard the works of the Lord. What desolations God has brought upon the earth. Behold the one who makes war to cease in all the world, who breaks the bow and shatters the spear and burns the shield with fire. Be still then and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. The second reading is from Romans chapter 3, verses 19 to 28. Paul's words stand at the heart of the preaching of Martin Luther and other Reformation leaders. No human beings make themselves right with God through works of the law. We are brought into a right relationship with God through the divine activity centered in Christ's death. This act is a gift of grace that liberates us from sin and empowers our faith in Jesus Christ. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be silent, and the whole world may be held, be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by being prescribed by the law. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed, and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of both things? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from work prescribed by the law. The Holy Gospel is taken from the Gospel according to St. John, the 8th chapter, verses 31 to 36. Jesus speaks of truth and freedom as spiritual realities known through his word, he reveals the truth that sets people free from sin. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, 
you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free. The gospel. In case you have forgotten, here they are. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make idols. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You shall remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet. The covenant of which God initially speaks, the old covenant, were the laws set down in stone tablets and delivered to the Israelites by Moses from Mount Sinai. The tablets were immediately destroyed when Moses threw them on the ground because he came down from the mountain to see the chosen people of God worshipping a golden calf. God made a second set of stone tablets which ended up in the Ark of the Covenant. That didn't stop the Israelites from disobeying the commandments nor did wandering 40 years in the wilderness. And people wonder why the book of Jeremiah seems to be filled with gloom and doom. After 40 years of disobedience, wouldn't you be a little disgruntled? What then is new about the new covenant? First, the new covenant involves a surgical procedure, rewriting the human heart. The biblical understanding of the heart is that it is the center of human intellect and will, knowing what is right and having the desire to do it. Jeremiah promises that God will replace this deeply engraved sinful heart with a new heart engraved with God's law, written in God's own handwriting. People will obey not because they are supposed to obey, but because they naturally want to obey. Obedience will become habitual and second nature. We will love God and neighbor just for the fun of it often without even realizing what we are doing. The Old Covenant stressed one person teaching the faith to another. The New Covenant stresses God's action in getting inside our heart and reprogramming our words, actions, habits, and feelings to conform naturally to become the faithful servants of God we were created to be. A third important item in God's recovery is a generous forgiveness that wipes the slate of the past totally clean, from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. We often place tight limits on forgiveness. Just as Peter asked Jesus, how many times we forgive those who wrong us? Seven times? Jesus 
reflecting a new covenant kind of forgiveness, corrected Peter. No, 70 times 7. This forgiveness is generous and extended to all, from the wretched and despised, the great and the honored. And it will all be God's doing. The people have not demonstrated a great aptitude for faithfulness during the many years of the old covenant. So this time, God will do it differently. This time, the covenant relies solely on God's mercy. God's ever-present grace in forgiving a disobedient people and calling them back into relation. The themes of a new or renewed covenant and of God's overwhelming grace are, of course, fitting for a celebration of Reformation Day. Martin Luther did not believe that he had discovered something radically new in the scriptures when he found there the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith. He rediscovered a treasure that the church of his day had largely lost. The movement he began was as much a restoration as a reformation or reformation. The rediscovery of God's abundant grace in the new established in and uh, sorry, abundant grace in the new covenant established in and through Christ Jesus. Luther was restoring the church to a right understanding of the covenant. There is then, in Luther's theology, a deep continuity with what came before. Luther knew that God's nature does not change. God one is and will continue to be a God of great mercy, forgiveness, and love for a wayward people. It is that people, the church's understanding of God's nature, that has become, that became clouded in Luther's day. Like Jeremiah then, Luther called the people of his day to a new understanding of God and a renewed emphasis on God's grace and God's abiding love, even for sinful people. And it is all God's doing. In and through Jesus Christ, the God of Jeremiah continues to forgive, renew, reform, and call God's people into right relationship with him and with one another. God is faithful, even when we are not. That is the good news that both Jeremiah and Luther proclaim, and it is news that can and should be celebrated on this Reformation Sunday with great joy. Are we there yet? Have we arrived in those days that are surely coming? Yes and no. God worked restoration for exiled Israel in the 6th century BCE. And God brought restoration to all people and all the world in Jesus Christ. But we still await the time when God will have written the law indelibly on all our hearts. We are thankful in the meantime for the daily forgiveness and renewal God continues to bring through the gospel in every generation. The hymn of the month is in four voices. Number 134, there was a child in Galilee. Prayers of intercession. God of grace and God of glory. On this Reformation Sunday, we give you thanks for the saints who have gone before us, for those who face trouble and trial, 
and even death, for the sake of the message of your mercy, and in the spirit of Pentecost, the right to hear and read the scriptures in their own languages. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray especially for those who face trouble, trial, even death. Now, for those members of the body of Christ who face persecution, for your beloved children everywhere, regardless of tradition, who live under the threat of religious persecution, for people, especially those who are indigenous, who face the extinction of their own languages through neglect, oppression, or cultural pressure. We pray that all may hear the good news of the Prince of Peace in ways that resonate and cause us to drop our weapons and defenses for the sake of the kingdom. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that you may help us not only walk in the shoes of our forebears, but fill them. May all of us gathered here today be captivated by the life you have given us in Christ, that we are free to reach our friends, neighbors, and enemies with your unconditional love. God, in your mercy, hear our friends. Lord, we pray for the world you love in hope and in trust that we and your church might carry the light that has been passed down through the centuries, so we might be a beacon of your love to the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As you have been loved, love. As you have been welcomed, welcome. As you have been fed, feed. As you have received, give. And may the boundless love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the presence of the Holy Spirit be always with you. Amen. The sending song is in Voices United, number 262, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Go in peace, who love and serve our God.